here with her, and uh, they will be having cake and pizza and all kinds of good things, and uh, I think I'm having a ham and cheese sandwich after church, but that's okay. Don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. In welcoming all of you, I mean it sincerely, and if you're visiting with us, we are especially glad to have you, and if you're willing to and have not before, we would love for you to fill out a welcome card that you should find in a little pocket in a chair near you and just drop that in the offering plate in a little while. And then along with that, Dave Tanner has asked me to mention, if you have not had your picture taken for our church directory, if you're a part of our church family, whether you join with us or whether you attend regularly or whatever the case may be, we would love to have your picture. And so Dave is available to shoot you right outside. <laughs> He'll meet you right outside the front door here, and uh, we'll, we'll have a record of that. And uh, so uh, Ken Bosman, that means you. Also, uh, just want to mention to you opportunities that we have. Uh, if you would like to receive a church newsletter, let us know. We'll make that available to you. Remember, Sunday school meets uh, at 9 o'clock here before the worship service each Sunday. I taught today and will next week, but uh, have no fear. Greg Poland will return the week after that. He and Gene both send greetings. I got pictures from them from Glasgow, Scotland yesterday, and so had a picture of a statue of John Knox holding forth there in, in Glasgow at the cathedral. But uh, Greg and Jean send their love and regards and looking forward to being back with us. Uh, thankful for the movie night on Friday. I wasn't able to stay for all of it because of some sinus things I've had going on. But uh, those of you who got to see the Jesus Revolution, I'm sure that was a blessing to you and we're grateful for that opportunity. Uh, Thursday evening Bible study, Dave Nash will be back, Lord willing, this Thursday as we'll continue our study of the book of Nehemiah. And ladies, remember your luncheon this Wednesday, the 27th at Olive Garden. If you have not yet let uh, Rachel know that you're planning to come, please do that. You're invited, but uh, we need to have a head count, so let her know if you're planning to come. Does that sound good? Okay. Well, I wouldn't say perfect. And then, October the 10th, choir rehearsal. That's correct. October 10th, it's our first choir rehearsal right here in this room. And I invite uh, former choir members uh, with me. Uh, you know, it's been, this is the 10th choir. Um, uh, and uh, so if, if it's brand new to you, please come. And if it's not, please come also. <laughs> Six o'clock on Tuesday. Okay, 6 o'clock on Tuesdays, beginning October the 10th. And then just a little housekeeping matter as um, we uh, continue to give thanks for Carl Hamm joining our church staff and uh, getting us organized and uh, looking after our facilities and managing things from an administrative point of view. You may have noticed that uh, Carl's office is there in the church nursery. Um, that doesn't say anything about his maturity level. <laughs> It just says a lot about how we are limited on space here in the building. But I want to assure you that that room will also be used when we have young children and infants among us. It's still usable for a church nursery. So I don't want you to think that we're giving up on the notion of taking care of children when they're here. We're just trying to, you know, be flexible and uh, be able to get multi-use out of our facilities. I mean, who knows? Uh, we may have to use the pastor's study for something these days. I wouldn't mind babies being changed in there. So, you know, we all step up and do what we need to do. But I, I just didn't want you to be concerned and thinking about, oh, no, they're getting rid of the church nursery. No, we're just, it's a multi-use room. And uh, Carl can use that for an office during the week. And we've got it available for a church nursery on Sundays or whenever we need it. So just a little housekeeping. Wanted to mention that to you as we give thanks for the Lord's provision for us, for all who serve here. Well, I don't know why I'm forgetting. I just uh, selfishly asked for prayers this week as uh, we've got meetings on uh, committee meetings for Mission to the World uh, in Atlanta. Uh, but my childhood friend that I've known since fourth grade, Bruce Bowman, succumbed to cancer yesterday. And his mom and dad have asked if I can come and do the service there in Waynesville this week. So I'll be trying to get there from Atlanta, back to Atlanta for meetings, and then a graveside service in Savannah. And then back here with you next week. So just appreciate your prayers. But you know we're here. 
We live in this sinful world, and we're dealing with the consequences of it. And so death is a reality. The Bible tells us in no uncertain terms. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But you know what? We have a Savior. And the judgment need hold no fear over us. We can stand on that day and be justified, even as we can be now, through faith in Christ alone. And so may the Lord bless us just now to prepare our hearts and minds to worship the one true and living God who is more awesome than we can even begin to comprehend. Good morning, everyone. Would you please join me in our call to worship inside your front cover of your bulletin or on the screen? And today our scripture is Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. And so we may be pilgrims in a barren land, but we have a God who guides us. Let's stand together and sing, Guide thee, O thou great Jehovah. Be thou still my strength and shield. 
Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have condescended to meet with us here today. You are the great God who created the heavens and the earth by a word. And now, God, you have said you seek such worshipers who worship you in spirit and in truth. Today, God, we are here to meet with you and to extol the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you might be with us and in us and among us, that you would fall on us by your Holy Spirit, that our worship truly might be such that would be a pleasing fragrance to you. And God, we pray that as we leave this place today, we might be able to look at one another and say together, today we have met with Almighty God. Hear us, O oh God, we make our prayer. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he who lived and died and rose again and who while on this earth taught his apostles to, to taught his d- disciples to pray saying our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up these people, but you have not let me see your, you have not let me know who you will send with them. Then you have said, I have This is the reading of the word of God, Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt about his waist and faithfulness the belt about his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of a cobra, and the wean child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be
as we come forward this time, we'll continue our worship of Almighty God as we present to him our tithes and offerings. Would you please bow for prayer with me? Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your generous nature, that, uh, that it's your kindness that not only inspires us, but has brought us to repentance. God, we thank you for the, for the wealth that you have bestowed upon us, and we thank you for putting us in this part of your beautiful creation. We pray now that these gifts and these offerings that we bring to you today, we pray that you would bless them and multiply them, using them to build your church here in southwest Florida and to the ends of the earth. We make our prayer in the name of Jesus, who is indeed our strong Savior. Thank you, Rachel. A beautiful, beautiful job on a beautiful song. To be God's people, what a privilege. But you know what? We can't do it by ourselves. We need the Spirit of God to come and change our heart. And so we sing now, change my heart, O God, that I might be 
one of those people that Rachel just sang about. Would you stand, please? Change my heart, oh God. <laughs> take from your bulletins the, the pray for list. We'd appreciate that. And add to that what Patrick shared with us earlier today. He has a lot of windshield time in his future. And uh, we want to pray for him as he has his meetings in Atlanta for our, our, nat our international missions uh, effort. And then want to pray for him as uh, as he leads at a memorial service for his dear friend. Uh, we want to pray for Chuck. Keep Chuck in mind, my brother. Many of you have asked about him, uh, and he he needs prayer. And uh, you, you have the list before you. You may pick out two or three of those for which you'd pray silently, and I'll conclude us after time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God and Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the quietness of this moment, thanking, thanking you for the blessings that we've received from your hand. God, we have been guilty of seeking the blessing and not the blesser. And so today we would, would re repent before you for that, and at the same time, God, we would acknowledge our frailty and our need for help in this world. Some of us haven't enjoyed a what many would call a charmed life. And yet we know that even for the, the most charmed of this world, there are rough waters ahead. God, it is a reminder to us that we indeed are not home yet. forward to that day when we will enter into the city whose foundations are from, from our great God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great country in which we live, and we are, we are blessed beyond words, God, that we, that we are here, and as we see millions of people coming across the border because they want to be in this country. Uh, from all over the world, and God, we thank you that we, in fact, were born here and enjoy uh, the citizenship that we do. 
Heavenly Father, we would pray for those men and women who are on the front lines, who are uh, standing a watch, who are guarding our country uh, around the world. And we pray that, that you would protect them and keep them uh, safe in the discharge of their responsibilities, and that their missions would be successful. Things are happening that we are not even aware of, God, and we just pray that you would protect those people. And then, God, we would, we would pray for our, our local first responders and pray for them, that you would keep them safe, that they would be effective as they carry out their responsibilities. God, we pray for those in need. We pray for Pastor Patrick as he heads uh, to uh, Georgia, North Carolina, to say uh, goodbye and lead uh, his friends, his friend's friend, in uh, m memorializing this uh, this uh, dear saint. And so, God, we pray for him as he goes and as he travels to Savannah. God, we pray that you would protect them and keep them safe and bring them back to us safe. And God, we would pray for those who. Uh, are struggling with physical issues. We pray for Chuck as he goes in for procedure this week. We pray for my brother, Jeff, and for Don and for, for the Bob France family um, in part here today. We pray that you would continue to strengthen them and help them through a difficult time now. And we pray for uh, Ron Kellums as he's been struggling, for Dory, uh, as she recovers, for Julie and Jennifer, for Kevin Marina St. Clair, God, we pray for your blessing on them, for, for Gary too, for Bonnie, for, for Janet, Annette Sachs, her sister-in-law, for Lori and Kay and Nancy, for Norma Jean, Patrick's mom, for Mike and Augie. Dear God, help Augie in, in this most difficult time of his life. And for Beverly, Max, Jan, and John, God, we give you our heart's desire, which would be that you would heal them. But God, even more than that, would you draw near to them, that they'd be assured of your presence with them. God, thank you for the good ministries with which you're associated. Pray for Love, Inc. today in particular. And um, we, we pray that you would bless them as they help those who are struggling with life in this world. Now bless our pastor as he brings us uh, your message today. Would you fall on him by your Holy Spirit and would you quicken our hearts and our minds thanking you for it and we make our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you pastor. Looking at these beautiful flowers I'm reminded of a conversation I had with Linda Story last week and that uh, Tomorrow is Jackie Leonard's birthday. At least that was what I was told. She's got her son Mark here with her. And today, I happen to know it's my friend Joe Widener's birthday. And there may be others of you who are celebrating too. Um, you know, my wife's family, birthdays are a serious matter. In fact, they don't have birthdays in my wife's family. It's more like birth weeks and birth months. And <laughs> celebration goes on. And, you know, in my family, it was kind of like, oh, it's your birthday today. By the way, did you get the wood split? So I'm grateful to be able to celebrate birthdays. For all of you who are celebrating, knowing that many of you are dealing with heavy things, we have those, don't we? It's part of life. But we come here to worship because we realize the solution that has been provided for us. And I hope you know that solution. I hope you know him. I hope you know the Lord Jesus and the power of his resurrection. And we see him so wonderfully communicated to us in the scriptures the reason we have hope is this word of God inscripturated so that men of old inspired by the spirit give us real truth. We don't know if reporting that we see in media, if they're, if they're giving us the real story, the whole story. They're just telling us what they want us to know. But you don't have to wonder about that when you open the scriptures. You have God's truth revealed. So let's read together. Luke Chapter 9, we've come to verse 37. We'll read through verse 50. Hear the word of the Lord. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. 
And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about his saying. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word. We give him praise for it. Amen. Marveling at the things of God, whether we look at a sunset or whether we gaze upon a mountain view or whether we simply are listening to the coo and sigh of a child. You know, Kathy and I get these little videos from, uh, from our children, Sarah and Joseph will send us little snippets of videos that have our grandsons in them. And, you know, it really doesn't matter what they do. We always ooh and ah, and we think it's absolutely the greatest thing in the world. Whether it's uh, little Ethan in his high chair with his peanut butter smeared all over his face, or whether it's Winchester and Sutton with their school group standing and singing before a congregation, and we can't even hear them sing, but we know they're just doing absolutely great and it exceeds anything that Pavarotti could have ever dreamed of. (laughs) We're astounded and we're amazed. We're grateful. There's no feeling like that feeling of seeing family and those that we love and knowing that there is love. When we look at the Lord Jesus, we see the manifestation of God's love as we do in no other. Christ that one who fills the role that we wish to be filled. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning in the book of Judges. We see all these very deeply flawed and imperfect people who come on the scene or the means of deliverance, and yet they are deeply flawed and imperfect. I talked about as a kid in Sunday school, you know, I wanted to be like Samson, all strong, tear the gates off of the, from the wall of the village and carry it over to a hilltop and just leave it there. You know, all that great strength. But then you see Samson with all of his profound flaws. You wonder, oh, wait a minute. I'm not sure that I want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. And so we have this need within our hearts to see someone on the scene who will actually do something about the problems that we're facing. We have this world. We're living in it. We see all the evidence of God by virtue of the creation. And yet we see all that is wrong with the world as we watch the news or as we're by the bedside of a loved one who's dying with cancer. We see what's wrong with the world. And we wonder, is there anyone, is there anything that can fix this? And we come to the scriptures and we see that there is one. There is one by whose indestructible life we have hope. And so they've been on the Mount of Transfiguration. The disciples in those moments, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, at least the disciples that were with Jesus, saw him gloriously transfigured and for just a moment, They saw the reality of the Son of God who lived on earth for the most part with his true identity veiled in flesh, unable to see the 
glory of God that he is. But in just a moment, they saw him. And in that flash of a moment, the reality. And yet, they come down from the mountain. Jesus returns to his normal appearance. And there's this immediate opposition. You know, no more than they had had this tremendous experience than Satan demonstrates his opposition to the things of God by Jesus being confronted by this poor young child who manifests all the symptoms of an epileptic seizure. But as we read the scriptures, we realize that in this case, it's caused by a demon. That is not to suggest that all such seizures are demonic in nature. We know that that's a physical manifestation of the fall of our being in a sinful world as well. But in this case, it was demonic in nature. So having come down from the mountain, and think about the message that can be derived from this portion of Scripture, because we've all been on the mountaintop. We've all been up where things are going well, and we feel the, the wind in our face. It's like when you eat a York peppermint patty. Well, I just dated myself, didn't I? And that exhilaration which comes from experiencing God's blessings and on the mountaintop, the transfiguration happens. We see who Jesus really is. But then in this sinful world, we inevitably come down from the mountain and we find ourselves back in the valley and we're confronted with the realities of life. And here is this poor child. Teacher, I beg you. Can you hear the desperation in his voice? We can't even hear his voice, but it leaps from the page. He's desperate for help. No one can... Get his son out of this predicament. Teacher, I beg you, look at my son. He's my only child. The thing that's made the passing of my friend so difficult came to light to me yesterday when talking to his parents on the phone. He is their only child. You hear it in the voice, even as you read the words on the page. This evil spirit seizes him. There's this there's this inability to get away from this awful experience caused by this demonic spirit. He suddenly cries out. It convulses him. It foams at the mouth. It shatters him. And it's shattering the heart of his father. And he's desperate. Who can help him? We can look for help in all kinds of places. We can seek it in all sorts of ways. But help only comes from the one who's able to provide help. Yes, we can call out and we can seek it all we want. But in the end, there's only one who can rescue us. I saw an article. I didn't read it because I wasn't all that interested or infatuated by it. But nevertheless, this very rich man, I think, to be a billionaire, I, I saw that he's taking over 100 pills every day vitamins, supplements, and other things, and he's exercising and working out. There's a picture of him. He looks all buff, you know. <laughs> I pump you up. You know, he looks <laughs> really something. But his intention of going to all of this extreme lengths is so that he can continue to live and not die. And I was looking at that, and I thought, buddy, I've got news for you. You may be just as healthy as you can be when you check out, but you're going because the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Unless Jesus returns before it happens, he's going to leave here. He's going to die, and so are all of us. That's not the issue. It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if. It's when. But who's your help as you lift your eyes to the hills? Where does your help come from? If you look to the Lord, there is real help. There is real rescue. There is real deliverance. And so this man comes to the right person for help. You know, he'd look to his disciples. I begged your disciples desperately. He's looking for anybody. He wanted them to cast out this demon, but they could not. In the other gospel accounts, Jesus makes clear that this type can only come out by prayer. Apparently, the disciples, as they had had the experience of being able to wield something of the power of God in their recently being sent out and having cast out demons, they come up against something that they can't handle. Christ alone prevails against sin, its consequences, and all the forces of wickedness. Yes, we can get temporary help from a number of people. Our brother Chuck Whitmer is going to be going in for surgery on Tuesday, and we're praying that the 
procedure will be successful, that the restore of blood will be restored to his heart. Oh, precious is the flow. And we're praying that that will be restored to him. Because the doctors have the skill and ability to be able to perform this procedure. But, but we know those skills are limited. Ultimately, all of us at some point are going to have an ailment that they can't remedy. No amount of medicine, no amount of surgery will be able to accomplish it. Christ alone prevails against all, even death. Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. You see, there's nothing lacking in the power of God, but often our faith is lacking because we have a, such a tendency to trust in ourselves. And so... We see the answer. There is one who is able to help. There is one who is able to deliver. That even though we will ultimately succumb to something, when our faith is in the Lord Jesus, we will find ourselves in his presence because Christ has said, he who believes in me will never die. Death, our enemy, in Christ becomes our friend. For what is death but the means by which we are ushered from this life into his presence? Have you ever thought about it that way? We're just simply moving from the land of the dying to the land of the living. Jesus has done that for us. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. This child, an object of Satan's scorn, is delivered because the Son of God has the power to deliver him, and he has the power to deliver you. Now, in the immediate sense, we may continue to be encumbered with that sickness or illness, but there is coming a day when in the presence of the Lord we'll realize that there are no more tears, there's no more sorrow, there's no more death or dying. All of that will be no more. I'm looking forward to it more and more. And so, here they are. Bring your son. Bring him here. And even while he's on the way, Satan through this evil minion of his, this, this demon, this other fallen angel that has somehow come to inhabit this poor child, does his dead level best at the last moment to prevent the power of Christ from being manifest, and it's absolutely a futile effort. Yes, the child is thrown down. He's exhibiting all the symptoms that he had previously and other such attacks, but Jesus... Do you see those two words? But Jesus. Is that, that wonderful preposition? But. You see, the power of God is sufficient. The power of the Lord Christ is sufficient to deliver and to save. And so... Always healed. Jesus gives him back to his father, and all were astonished at the majesty of God. It isn't that people are all of a sudden saying, Oh, wow, look at this band of disciples. Look at all of these people who are hanging out with Jesus. They really are something. No, they were awed by the majesty of God. I pray and trust that in your life you have experienced that. that whether it is in a sunset or a sunrise or whether it's looking at a child on a cell phone in a video, that you give praise and thanks to God for the indication of his power and might. But what we also see is that while the work of Christ is clearly displayed for us, we have all the evidence we need in the scriptures, and we have all that in harmony with historical evidence. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus, for example, one of C.S. Lewis's intellectual friends at, um, in England. They were holding forth. and You know, brilliant men. One man saying to Lewis, he said, you know all these stories and fables and myths about some God coming to earth and coming back from the dead? Well, you know, it seems as if there was somebody that actually did that. Somebody who had studied and looked hard into the evidence and the indicators of it 
And it is absolutely that rock that you cannot get around in any study of history is just who is the Lord Jesus and what is it that he really did as the cross stands out in glorious, wondrous contrast to all of the world. And as we consider the resurrection of the Christ, the fact that we're meeting on this first day of the week and bearing testimony to its reality. And yet, as clearly displayed as all of that is, it is absolutely unseen undiscerned by those who are not enlightened by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them, you know, they were prone to think, oh, wow, here's a great victory. Can't wait till he's seated on the, in the place of government and he's ruling over this earthly Israel. Jesus had to tell them, you know, I'm about to be delivered into the hands of men. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. They didn't want to hear that. In fact, they didn't hear it. They didn't understand it. It was concealed from them, the scripture says, that they might not perceive it. How can that be? It's a mystery, isn't it? That all of this wonderful evidence and truth that is on such display for us, and yet so many people who don't see it, who don't get it, it's concealed from them. If you've come to the place where you've trusted in the Lord Christ, give praise and thanks to God. Don't ever for a moment laud yourself and say, in some way, you know, boy, it's a good thing I got this. I'm so glad I'm smarter than all those other people. I thank you that I'm not like them. No, if you come to that place, it's because God has revealed it, because he has worked in you. Look at that in Luke 9, 45, and take note. And yet, even as it was concealed for them that they would not perceive, the day was coming when they would understand. John chapter 14, verses 25 to 26. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. There's coming a day when they will see, and they saw, and we have it recorded for us. Paul says simply in 1 Corinthians 2.10, These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, so that all the glory is his. Now, moving quickly, as they are marveling and as they are hearing words that don't resonate in their hearts, don't register, as they don't understand, yet nevertheless, Jesus is testifying and saying, they start arguing about who's the greatest. Is this not an accurate portrayal of humanity? Here, the majesty of God is on full display. At the very moment when they should have been in awe and saying, oh my, the power of God, this little child is delivered and our Savior is going to suffer inexplicably for our sakes. But instead of being awed by that, an argument breaks out and says, oh, I just wonder who is the better preacher. Is that not so like us? Ian Duguid, that I've quoted there in your bulletins, you've got the full quote in the meditation. In God's program, growing means becoming smaller. As Jesus put it, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. Greatness in his kingdom is a gift God gives to the humble, not a prize to be grasped by the proud. It's telling that in our generation, in our day, that pride is held up as a virtue. Got a whole month dedicated to pride. But lest we look and say, how could those people think that way? We have only looked to our own hearts and realized that that's our tendency too, to make much of ourselves and neglect the things of God. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Don't be talking about who is the greatest. The greatest one is the Lord Jesus. There's only one in that position. And so, later on in chapter 10, which we'll get to eventually in verse 21, we find the Lord Jesus saying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. You see, as he brings that little child and has him there beside him, 
he demonstrates for us what the kingdom of God is really like. He doesn't, he doesn't bring in Pilate. He doesn't call to Rome to have Caesar sent as an example. No, he brings a little child and places him beside him and says, Oh, this is what it's about. Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Instead of arguing about who's the greatest among us, we should be giving praise and thanks to God that he's revealed this truth, not to great people, but to little children like us. Now, by the way, he commends to us childlikeness, not childishness. Now, do you get the distinction between those two things? I think sometimes in the church we have gotten them confused. And it seems as if childishness has become a virtue. This age that we live in, after all, would have us stay in some stage of adolescence. That's what's commended to us. People out there acting wild and crazy and yelling as if they have no self-control whatsoever because they don't. Apart from God's spirit, we don't. But it's as if we, we hold up immaturity as a virtue. God's not commending childishness to us, but childlikeness, that we would trust in him as a little child, trust those around them. And so that's commended to us. Finally, I had to make four points because I'm trying to get in as much as I can, you know. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him. <laughs> he wasn't one of us. He doesn't follow with us. And of course, Jesus uses that as a means of teaching a lesson too. Don't stop him for the one who is not against you is for you. Now, this is elaborated on a little more in other places, but the idea is have a gracious attitude toward all others who serve the Lord. It doesn't mean that we would make them elders in our church or that they would even have a place in this pulpit, but nevertheless, we should be gracious toward all who serve the Lord, even if they're not among us. I'm grateful for the way in which that kind of cooperation has been extended to me through the years. I experienced it last night. Bruce's parents wanted me to do the service, asked me to do it together with their former pastor. So I called Eddie Dietz, got his name in my phone, and talked to him. And he said, oh, I'm glad to serve with you, and just let me know what scripture you want to read, and I'll choose something else. And I said, no, sir, you choose the scripture, I'll choose something else. And we got in an argument about that over the phone. <laughs> And I had to catch myself, and I thought, boy, I'm so thankful. Here's a man in another denomination who could easily say, you know, you're not going to be preaching in one of your churches. This is one of ours. But there was none of that. And then the man who was currently the pastor called me late last night just to say, I want you to come. I want you to preach your friend's funeral. He didn't have to do that. And I want to extend that kind of gracious kindness toward others in our service to the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Instead of arguing over who's the greatest, or me trying to get my way, how can we serve the Lord together? in his way. And then finally, Philippians 1. First of all, in verse 15, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. Now, what's he saying there? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? People preach Christ for different reasons. They're different motivations. I'm ashamed to say that things haven't changed. We have people doing it today who are in it for the money. It offers a certain prestige or power or whatever it may be. Now, we can turn our guns around and start shooting at each other because of this tendency, or we can follow through with what Paul says in verse 18. What then? What about all of that? What's he concerned about? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. It doesn't mean that we are to be undiscerning. It doesn't mean that we are to set aside all thought 
in consideration of others who are engaged in ministry, but it does mean we're to have a gracious attitude toward them and realizing that they're not against us, they're for us if we have this understanding of the gospel and simply giving thanks that Jesus is being proclaimed. Sure, they may not do it the way that I would, and there may be reasons that I would offer such a critique, but I give thanks that Christ is being proclaimed. And so in living life, it's another reminder to us that whatever our circumstances may be, that whatever is wrong with us, all of that is an indication of a world that's gone terribly wrong. What more evidence do you need? What statistics could I possibly quote to you that indicate to us that the world is not going in the right direction? It's not just the government in Washington or in, in London or Moscow. It's not just those indicators. It's, it's what's happening every day around us. There's a memory care center right over here across the road and other places like that of, of those whose memory is leaving them. And we realize that all is not right with this world. What can possibly be the remedy? Medical science has not risen to the level of being able to deliver us from everything. Sure, they can put a splint or a cast on a broken bone, but who can deliver us from this awful manifestation of sin and depravity? I'm telling you, only Jesus. Even though it's not realized in full here, it will be. And every day, whether you're trying to balance your checkbook or whether you're trying to balance all those doctor appointments, you know, my dad said he never had to keep a calendar when he was working, but after he's retired now and he's 91 years old, he said, you know, his calendar is more filled up than it's ever been with doctor appointments. They're always going to see somebody. And you're trying to balance all of that. How can I maintain my sanity? How can I keep taking care of this loved one? It's not getting better. It's getting worse. She's getting worse. What can I possibly do? Remember the one who is the answer live out every day in faith, even though we cannot understand this world and its entanglement. Somebody posted this past week, you know, it was one of those little pictures of, of something that had been done in cross-stitch or needlepoint. I, I can't tell one from the other. I, don't, I never didn't know the difference between knitting and crocheting. So I'm, I, I can't explain to you sewing any better than I could tell you how to make fudge right now. I just know that when something's good, I like it. And you see one of these things that's been carefully done, you know, needlepoint, cross-stitch, weaving, whatever it is. It looks wonderful, but then you turn it over and you see the back side, and you've got all these wads and skeins of yarn there, and it, it, the image is entirely imperceptible. That's what life looks like right now. It looks like a mess. I can't make any sense out of that whatsoever. But you know what? God has designed that because there is the front side. We'll see it one day because Jesus never fails. He was on the scene in this moment to do what was necessary, and he is here now by the power of the Holy Spirit to redeem us and to save us so that one day, one day, as we see him in his beauty, we will see this world in all the mess that it has appeared to be, and suddenly all will be beauty because the great master has been at work to accomplish things that are far more wonderful than we can discern now. But it takes faith to believe that. And I trust and pray that by the power of God's Holy Spirit, your faith is firmly fixed in him. And that you are willing to say, as the hymn writer of old has declared, wherever he leads, I'll go. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise and thanks. As we all face hard days and hard moments and we get news we don't want to hear, and we have to deal with life as it is rather than as we would like it to be. And Lord, our hearts are filled with disappointment and sadness and heaviness and the weight. Or maybe in the moment things are going well and there's joy and jubilation, but because we've lived life long enough, we know that sooner or later we're coming down off of that mountain and we're going to be in the valley. But even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. 
for thou art with us. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We know that's only because of you. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Wherever he leads, that's where I'm going. And wherever he leads, go. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with and abide with you all, now and forevermore. And everyone said together. Amen.